Hello and welcome to my lesson. Uh, my name is Mr. Johnson. This is my 20 minute lesson on key stage three, acids and alkalis. So I'm just gonna get started. I'm gonna share my screen with you. You should be able to see the title screen now. So yeah, chemistry, key stage three, acids and alkalis. This is sit for year seven to nine and is a good introduction to what acids and alkalis are. So, by the end of this lesson, you should be able to identify a couple of different types of indicators, what they do, their color range and limitations. Then describe the properties and uses of an acid with some examples. And finally, describe the properties and uses of an alkali with some examples. So not too much. Indicators then. An indicator is a plant dye or a substance that can tell us the pH or the um, acid or alkalinity of a substance. This allows us to determine if it is an acid, an alkali, or if it's neutral, neither acid nor an alkali. Indicators change colour in the presence of an acid or an alkali or a neutral substance. Different types of indicators exist. Each indicator can tell us something different about the pH of a substance. As an example, uh, blackberry juice, red cabbage juice, even tea can be used to indicate whether something is an acid or an alkali. Different indicators then can be mixed together to give an indicator with a greater range of colour changes. And we'll talk about this more later on as we go through this lesson. But these indicators are better at giving us a greater range of information about the pH of a substance and whether it's strongly or weakly acidic or alkaline. First indicator we're going to look at is litmus indicator. It's the classic one for key stage three science. Litmus is an indicator solution. If you put a couple of drops of the solution into a substance that is an acid or an alkaline, it'll change colour. You can also get litmus paper and it comes in the same colours, red litmus, blue litmus and purple litmus paper. And it'll do exactly the same thing. Dip it in the solution that you're checking and it'll change colour. There are three different types of litmus then. Red litmus, blue litmus and purple litmus, which is a mixture of both red and blue. Different indicators can be mixed. These indicators give a greater range of information about the pH of the substance. Purple is an indicator that's been mixed from two other ones, so it can go two possible ways, red or blue from purple. So how is it used then? If we put litmus paper into a neutral solution, that's neither an acid nor an alkali, it will not change the colour of any litmus paper used. So if I'm using purple litmus, it will stay purple. If I use red or blue, it will stay red or blue. Acid substances always turn litmus red. So if I have a blue litmus or a purple litmus and I add an acid to it, it will make it change colour and it will look red. If we use blue or purple litmus to check a suspected acid and the colour doesn't change, then the substance is not acidic. So that's a negative test. Alkali substances always turn litmus blue. So if I have red or purple litmus and add an alkali substance to them, they should go blue. If we use red or lit purple litmus to check a suspected alkali and the colour doesn't change, then the substance is not an alkaline and we won't get a colour change. It will stay the colour it was when we first used it. So that means then that red litmus is an indicator of an acid solution. Blue is an indicator of an alkaline. Neutral solutions would stay purple. Strong or weak acids then? Some acids are stronger than others. Simple indicators like litmus can tell us if something's an acid, if it's neutral or if it's an alkaline but it can't tell us if it's a strong or a weak acid or alkali. And this is quite an important piece of information if you're a chemist, or for example, if you're looking at something that could be vinegar or could be battery acid and you don't want to know, you know <laughs> by testing it, by tasting it. So it's always better if we can measure something rather than just describing it. And to that end, a Danish chemist called Soren Peter Sorensen designed a pH scale to determine how strongly acidic or alkaline solution it is. And that was something that we talk about through this lesson. But universal indicator is something that allows us to measure pH and it's using the pH scale that Sorensen set up. Universal indicator is a mixture of lots of different indicators, all with their own color changes, depending on acidity or alkalinity. This gives us a range of different colors that can be used to determine if something's an acid, neutral or an alkali. And in fact, how strongly or weakly acidic it is or how strongly or weakly alkaline it is. And this colour can be mapped to a number on Sorensen's pH scale. So this is universal indicator mapped to the pH scale. And it's the colours of the universal indicator with the position on the pH scale. Acids lie from pH 1, 
to pH 6, which is the red to the yellow colour. Alkalised lie from pH 8 to pH 14, which is the dark green all the way across to what is a purpley blue colour. Neutral substances lie in the middle at pH 7. So you can see that acids are on one side, alkalis are on the other side of the scale, but right slap bang in the middle is the neutral substance. And this is going to be important later on. Now, the relative strength and colours of universal indicator for acids and alkalis can be shown with this scale too. We can use the colours of universal indicator with the pH scale to determine the strength of an acid or an alkali. It's worth noting that the further away from neutral something becomes, the stronger an acid or an alkali is. That means if I'm starting at seven, which is neutral, and I go to six, that's weakly acidic. But if I go to one, it's strongly acidic. Strong acids give color changes, red to orange, for pH one to three, and they're further away from neutral on the left-hand side, making them stronger. Weak acids are closer to the neutral point, and they give color changes through orange for yellow for pH four to six. Again, neutral being light green at pH seven, and Weak alkalis give colour changes from dark green to light blue for pH 8 to 10. They're closer to the neutral point, but on the right-hand side of it, whereas strong alkalis are furthest away from it, light blue to purple for pH 11 to 14. This information then allows us to know the dangers of a particular acid or alkali and the correct safety precautions to take in its handling and storage. And in fact, we use something called hazard symbols to point out what kind of precautions we should be taking when handling strong and weak substances. Weak acids and alkalis are labelled with this particular um, hazard symbol called irritant. These substances, once applied to your skin, can make them blister or become itchy. And it's for these ranges here and here. Strong acids and alkalis are labelled corrosive. These substances can damage organic material like skin or your eyes, and they can corrode through metal and wood. So they are very, very, very dangerous. They should be handled with care. And the symbols show that by showing them etching through hands and through a bar of wood or metal underneath. And that is the symbol for those ranges, 1 to 3 and 11 to 14. So that's identified different age indicators, their colour range and their limitations, and why we would use these different indicators. Properties of acids, then. <laughs> Acids can be corrosive. We've already mentioned this, but what it means is they attack metals, wood, and organic material like skin, damaging it in some cases quite severely. We can use them though because they have a sharp or a tangy taste. They can make indicators change color, which we've already concounted in our first learning objective, and they contain hydrogen. Um, it's better to say that they contain hydrogen that's given off as bubbles when they react with metals, because other things can contain hydrogen but don't give them off when they react with metals. So here's our example. We've got hydrochloric acid, ethanoic acid, water and alcohol. And in those we have a strip of magnesium, which is a metal. The hydrochloric acid, it looks cloudy because that's lots of gas being given off. It's hydrogen gas. Same with the ethanoic acid. It's reacting less strongly because ethanoic acid is a weaker acid in comparison to hydrochloric. Water is a neutral substance, so it contains hydrogen. We know the chemical symbol for water is H2O, but it doesn't get released as bubbles when it reacts with metal, which is why it's not an acid. And the same is true of alcohol. It contains hydrogen, but because it's not released by the reaction with metal as bubbles, we can say it's not acidic. Okay. Uses of acids then. Dr. Pepper, what's the worst that can happen? Well, I'll be honest with you. Some acids are safe enough for you to eat. Others use the batteries for cars and to remove paint. Dr. Pepper contains an acid that's still corrosive. It's phosphoric acid. It's added to fizzy drinks to make them taste tangier and fruit flavoured. They often soften the enamel coat on your teeth, meaning it's worn away more easily by the bacteria that live on your teeth and enjoy the sugary drinks that you enjoy. Citrus fruits also contain an acid. They contain citric acid, which is why a bottle of orange juice can be sometimes just as bad as a bottle of um, fizzy drink. Uh, it's what makes them taste sharp or tanger. Oranges don't taste as sharp as lemons and limes because they contain more natural sugars. So orange juice is not as tangy as lemon juice. But citrus fruits contain another acid, vitamin C, ascorbic acid, which is necessary for our continued good health. Um, other uses of acids, vinegar or acetic acid is another acid with an everyday use. We store foods in vinegar to prevent them spoiling or going off. This is called preserving or pickling. And uh, vinegar can be described then as a preservative. We use it to pickle foods. 
This is because the bacteria that would spoil the food can't survive in the acidic vinegar. It kills them. So the food stays fresher for longer over a greater period of time. This is a battery, car battery, if you take it apart. Car batteries are called lead acid batteries. They contain the metal lead and a strong acid called sulfuric acid. Now, sulfuric acid is a very strong acid, pH zero to one on the pH scale. It's very, very corrosive. It can be used to clean drains, um, of blockages by dissolving whatever's in there, whether that's hair or um, any sort of organic material from the sink or the bathroom. Um, we say that because its pH is very, very low, it's very, very acidic, but we say it's low on the scale. So this allows us to see how some of these acids align themselves up on the pH scale. Um, the car battery has the lowest pH score, making it the strongest acid, it's lowest down on the scale. Lemon juice also scores very low on the scale, around pH 2, explaining why it's very sour to taste. But you can also see that we've got pH 1, pH 2, pH 3 for vinegar, and then even a weak acid, pH 5, in our Dr Pepper. That's our second outcome. Our third outcome, describe the properties and uses of an alkali with examples. So properties of alkalis. Like acids, alkalis can be corrosive. They can attack metals, wood, and organic material like skin, damaging it. But unlike acids, alkalis can be a substance that react with oils and fats to make soap. And they contain a, a particular uh, ion called hydroxide rather than hydrogen. Now, the thing is, alkalis have been known about since ancient times when Arabic scientists used ashes from fires and mixed them with water. The resultant mix was boiled with animal fats to make what was called the first soap. In Arabic, these ashes were called alkali. Now, scientists nowadays use the word alkali, which comes from the derivative alkali, to describe a group of substances that make your skin soapy or make you feel soapy. So some uses of alkalis. You can see the soap and the toothpaste. Some alkalis are safe enough for you to handle. For example, soaps used to clean our skin. Your skin is naturally slightly acidic around pH 5.5. Soap, soap is slightly alkaline around pH 8 or 9. Some people find that using soap dries their skin out. So now you get manufacturers like Dove who develop skin friendly soaps that match the pH of skin, saying that it won't dry your skin out. Uh, when we eat, bacteria in our mouths convert the sugars in the food into plaque and sugar acids. Toothpaste and mouthwash are also weakly alkaline, around about pH 9. So brushing your teeth after eating means that the alkaline solution will neutralise the acid, preventing tooth decay. And we'll come across that term, neutralise, a little later on in the lesson. Oven cleaner is a very strong alkali. It's used to remove the grease and fats that build up in a cooker during the cooking process, and it needs to be strong enough to deal with stubborn baked-in oils and oil stains. Oven cleaner then is around pH 13, it's very high on the pH scale. It's not safe to handle as it would start to chemically attack the oils in your skin. As a result of this, people who use this wear gloves to protect their skin from contact with it. In this case, it would be classed as corrosive, so skin protection is necessary. Bleach is very high, highest on the pH scale with a value of 14. It is corrosive, just like oven cleaner. And because of this, it's used to clean surfaces and items like toilets and sinks. This is because microorganisms like bacteria are killed by contact with the bleach, meaning that the surfaces can be sterilized and kept clean and you know there's no danger of cross infection. It will react strongly with the oils in skin and as such it should always be handled with gloves and it is probably necessary to say in this day and age never ever ingested. Bleach is a highly toxic substance and it will strip oils all the way down and start causing all sorts of cellular damage if it was ever ingested or swallowed. So this again allows us to see how some of these alkalis score on the pH scale. The bleach solution is highest on the scale, followed closely by the oven cleaner. Mouthwash and soap are lower than the others, but they're still higher than the pH 7, which is neutral. So you can see how they're arrayed this way. So the final bit is what happens if you mix acids and alkalis, because it's the common cry in every science classroom. So what happens if you mix this? When an acid's added to an alkali, sorry about the misspelling there, a chemical reaction does actually take place. The acid and the alkali attack each other and two new substances are formed. There's a word equation, which is how scientists do kind of chemical shorthand. And the word equation for the general reaction of acid with an alkali is the acid plus the alkali convert into a neutral salt 
and water. That arrow means that the two product, the two reactants, acid and alkali, are turned into salt and water. We never use equals because that means the same. We're saying those two are turned into this. This is called a neutralization reaction then, because we've got an acid and an alkali, but the products that they've made in reacting are neutral. They're on the pH scale at pH seven, but this is only if the right quantities of acid and alkali are mixed. So if I take, for example, carbatry acid, sulfuric acid and bleach, and I mix them in the correct quantities, then it cancels out the acidity from the batteries, sulfuric acid and the alkalinity from the bleach. The resultant substance then moves from either side of the scale, strong acid and strong alkali, to the middle of the scale, pH 7 or, or neutral. This is then why we call a reaction a neutralization reaction. The product, the neutral salt and water, moves to the neutral point, pH 7 on the scale. And that's the end of our lesson today. So that's our final outcome. Describe the properties and uses of an alkali with examples and what happens when you add acids to alkalis for neutralization. Thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I hope to see you again next time. Take care. Bye bye.